Brian Barnett is just a regular guy. He's not a doctor. He has no legal license in any field of mental or emotional health. Brian Barnett merely shares the insights he's gained from his personal experiences for anybody who may choose to use such information as he or she personally chooses while accepting full responsibility for his or her own individual thoughts, feelings, behaviors, and actions. Brian Barnett assumes no responsibility whatsoever for anybody's individual choice to expose himself or herself to any information that Brian Barnett shares. And by listening to this program, you're acknowledging that you, and only you, are responsible for your own thoughts, feelings, Happy Thursday, everybody. How's everybody doing out there in the great and vast void? Wherever you are, I hope your week is going well. You're listening to The Last Symptom, and I'm Brian Barnett, the creator and host. I'm really happy to have you here this week. You know, there's so many other ways you could be using your time, but you've chosen to make listening to this program one of them, and I think that's a dandy decision. I'll try to make it worth your time. Before we get started, thelastsymptom.com. Thelastsymptom.com. I'm just going to say it one more time just for kicks. Thelastsymptom.com. That's my official website. There are free resources for you there. And there are a couple of paid services. If you're benefiting from my work and would like to show your appreciation and support, thelastsymptom.com, see how I slipped that in there again, also offers you the ability to leave me a secure donation. How else can you support my work? Leave this show a positive review on iTunes or whatever platform you use. Subscribe to the official YouTube channel. We'll be talking a little bit more about YouTube at the end of the show. But before we get into that, let me tell you a story. It's just a story. I just thought you guys might like to hear it. Long-time listeners know that I grew up in the deep Appalachian woods. We didn't have running water. We got our water out of a naturally occurring freshwater spring down over the hill. It was just a hole in the ground. And I'd literally take... A couple of buckets. When I was very young, I'd only take one bucket because a bucket, uh, you know, a five gallon bucket of water is really heavy. But as I grew and got stronger, I began taking down two buckets of water. And so that was one of my chores every night. And another one of my chores was to chop firewood and collect enough firewood each night for the back stoop. And uh, I had to make sure that I had enough there to get us through the night. And the next day, the last thing on earth I wanted to do was to be sent outside at 6 a.m. on a frigid winter morning to collect firewood or chop firewood because I hadn't done enough the night before. So that's what I did every night. Collect enough to make sure to get us through the night and the next day. We heated with a wood stove. The hundreds of acres around us were my and my brother's playground. And believe me, our adventures took us great distances into the woods. There's so many stories to tell there. For now, I'm just setting up the environment that I grew up in. For those of you who don't know me very well, the school I went to was a lot like Little House on the Prairie. If you ever saw that old television show. So the school was not in the school itself was not in the style of that same building. That's not what I mean. The building itself was very square and dated, but it was located out in the middle of nowhere, out in the middle of the country, and my bus ride every morning to grade school was an hour long. I got a lot of reading and thinking done on my bus rides. <laughs> Think of that, an hour bus ride every morning, and then again, an hour bus ride every evening on the ride home. So I did get through quite a few books in my younger years. I I was an insatiable reader, and man, I had an imagination. 
I could just stare out the bus window if I weren't reading and just my imagination would just imagine all sorts of things you wouldn't believe. One of my best friends in grade school, you've heard me talk about him, was Brian Lambert. Brian Lambert and I go back such a long way. It's a real rarity to have such long-running friendships. To give you an idea, we met when I was nine years old, and we're still extremely comfortable and tight with each other to this day. And I mean, we went 20 years with just minimal contact with each other. But when we reconnected, it was like not a day had passed. The story I wanted to tell you is about fishing. When Lambert was 11 or 12 years old, his mom and stepdad started letting him borrow the car. (laughs) No, I'm not kidding. They'd let him borrow the car when he was 11 or 12 years old, and he would drive a few miles down the back roads to my house. And there were a couple of ponds that were near me where I would go fishing just about every day of my life. And that's no exaggeration. I mean, when, when I would get home in the, you know, the warmer months of the year, on the school bus, and the school bus pulled up to my house, I would almost explode off the school bus and race to my fishing pole, grab my stuff, and head into the woods to go fishing. I th- I'd think about it the whole way home. Can't wait to fish. Can't wait to fish. One of the ponds was called Nola's Pond, which I've told you about before. The other was called Castle's Pond. Were these the actual names of the ponds? <laughs> no. The ponds had no name. We ourselves, as kids, are the ones who gave these things names. In fact, there's a place down in the woods that we called the Dirt Hill, which was a cliff. (laughs) It was a mud cliff, and uh, we would play down there for hours and hours and hours at a time. We even cut a, uh, a vine one time, and we could swing on that vine clear across this enormous ravine. I mean, we're We were 30 feet up off the ground swinging across this ravine. And uh, eventually I had a couple friends over. I've told you about my friend Eugene, Yui, who uh, is a real-life cowboy, breaks horses for a living, even rode rodeo. And uh, he and his brother come to visit one week. And uh, we all got the bright idea that we would all hang on this single vine and swing out over this ravine. And we did that, and it ripped and came loose from the treetops right out in the middle of the ravine. I mean, we went falling 30 feet. I'm not kidding. Of course, we're holding on to the vine, and the vine isn't, didn't just snap. It, it let loose and kind of slid down through the, the tree branches. So it wasn't a, a free fall. But still, we hit the ground pretty hard. But anyway, back to the story. I love fishing. I love fishing. I love cleaning my catch. I love putting the meat in the freezer and forgetting about it and getting it out months later and frying it up in a pan. Man, I got some stories to tell about that, too. When we'd be fishing as kids and it would get dark on us, you could see the bats swarming and swooping out over the pond. And do you know, this is true, that if you take a pebble or a rock and you toss it out into the open air where the bats are swarming around, their sonar will pick that pebble up, and you can watch the bats swoop all the way down to the ground or all the way down to the surface of the water chasing that pebble. They think it's an insect or something. That's true. Well, it was on an evening like this, the one I've just described, when Lambert took his family car and come out to see me so that we could go fishing down at Nola's Pond, and my cousin Jeremy went along with us. We'd been fishing for a while. It was starting to get dark, and we decided that we were going to have a casting contest. Do you know what that is? That's where you put the heaviest weight out of your tackle box (laughs) on the end of your line, and you see who can get the furthest cast. How far, who can get their line to go the furthest out into the water? 
So I said, I'm going to go first. And I wheeled back and let her rip. <laughs> Bloop. And Jeremy said, all right, it's my turn. He got up there and he wheeled back and whew, let her rip. <laughs> Bloop. Brian said, all right, you guys, you guys suck. Stand back. I'm going to show you how it's done. So we stood back. And I watched him wheel back, and I saw, <laughs> I saw his hook <laughs> when he wheeled back. My cousin Jeremy was standing behind him, and I, <laughs> I saw his hook drop right down on Jeremy's head. <laughs> I'm not making this up. And because this was a competition, believe me, nobody was casting at kind of half capacity. So Brian <laughs> Lambert wheels off and whoa, goes to cast, and that hook digs into Jeremy's head and just about pulls him straight into the water. But that is not the funniest part. The funniest part that it didn't even occur to Brian to look behind him to see what was going on. No, he just simply wheeled back again and let it... <laughs> And let it go again. He tried to cast the line again. It, it was just about yanking Jeremy's head off. Oh my goodness! And this hook had was just had dug into his skull. I kept. I started screaming, "Stop! Stop! Stop!" And Jeremy, he was just. He had his hands on the line, trying to keep his head from getting yanked off his shoulders. You know. I'm saying, "Stop! Stop!" So Brian finally stops, and uh, man, it was in there. It was in there solid. We could not get it out. I said, can you imagine if that had been his eye or something? Oh, my goodness. The tragedy that could have happened there. He's fortunate. My cousin Jeremy is fortunate that it was just his head. You know, the skin on your head's pretty, pretty tough. Well, we had to go up. And uh, we had to get the family involved. They had to take him to the hospital. He had to have that surgically removed. A hook is barbed, you know, so you can't just pull it out. It's got a barb on the end. It goes in, but it don't want to come out, not without making some serious damage. So they had to surgically remove it. Um, by the way, that reminds me, porcupine quills. Do you know what a porcupine is? Uh, I've encountered porcupines in the wilderness many times. And let me tell you, there is not a more docile creature in the forest than a porcupine. And I know what you're thinking. No, they can't shoot their quills. They aren't cartoon characters. You've learned that from cartoons. But porcupines, real porcupines, cannot shoot their quills like cartoon characters. But their barbs, their quills are barbed like a fish hook. So all you farm people know, if you've had a dog come into the yard after uh, exploring the woods for a few days and he comes back and his face is full porcupine quills, just what that dog's going through. You can't just pull the, the quills out. They either have to go all the way through, which means you have to push them forward to get them out, or they have to be surgically removed. Well, that's what happened to Jeremy. He had to have his <laughs> Brian Lambert's fish hook surgically removed. Well, we tell that story nowadays, and we just laugh our butts off that uh, <laughs> you had to have been there. How he wheeled back, and I mean, remember, this is a casting competition. We're not just kind of like, you know, limp-wristing it out there. We're, we're giving it our all, trying to get our line to go out as far as it would go. <laughs> And, uh, man, Jeremy's head just about <laughs> popping off his shoulders. I'm not kidding. Well, that's my campfire story for the week. Let's get into today's topic. The terminology you use matters. Now, it probably don't matter in all circumstances. You know, I talk pretty laid back when I'm just talking to you about life, you know, just my life, and I'm just talking to you casually. But when we're talking about recovery and escaping emotional unhealth, the terminology you use and listen to 
and are influenced by matters. A couple of episodes back, I tore into the professional community for promoting the term radical acceptance when what they're really just talking about is just plain acceptance. You know, there ain't different types of acceptance. There's normal acceptance, and anything shy of normal acceptance, do you know what that is? It's just denial. So the reality of the matter is, there is no such thing as partial acceptance. There's no such thing as different types of acceptance. Nope. Partial acceptance is just denial. Well, later, somebody sent me this definition for the word radical. Radical definition forming an inherent or fundamental part of the nature of something. Okay, good. This changes absolutely nothing that I stated about the incompetence of the professional community in choosing to create and use this term. Does the fact that there are no such thing as different types of acceptance change? No, it doesn't change. I don't have to come up with special terms for humility, special terms for patience, special terms for honesty, if I just accurately understand the meaning of those terms to begin with. You know, there's also no such thing as almost honest. (laughs) There's already a term for a person who is almost honest. Do Do you know what it is? Dishonest. You see how simple that is? Do you know what the term is for somebody who is not quite humble? Yeah, there's already a word for it. It's arrogant. Do you see that? Not quite humble isn't a real thing. It's simply arrogant or proud or haughty. You see, lots of terms already exist. But there's no such thing as not quite humble. If I simply understand the nature of what these things really are to begin with, do I really need to distinguish them further? How about radical honesty? (laughs) Is there any reason for me to create a new term like that? Maybe radical patience. No, there's absolutely no reason to do that. It creates the notion, whether intentionally or not intentionally, that there's such a thing as different types of honesty. You see, it, it implies that you've got regular honesty, But then you've also got radical honesty. It's a total waste of everything. Time, attention, energy. Ask yourself this. Where do I think the professional communities need to create these sorts of special terms come from, truly, if we're just being honest about it? And more importantly, do these terms facilitate people's understanding and authentic recovery or does it complicate it if it complicates it are the people creating these terms really helping you or are they doing more to hamper your efforts now did you notice i just used the term Authentic recovery? Authentic recovery. Am I not engaging in the same type of behavior as the professional community when I choose to take a term like recovery, which should be pretty cut and dry, and I start calling it authentic recovery? No, I'm not. The reason is that, again, the professional community as a group in their unbelievable incompetence, already long ago hijacked the term recovery and changed, twisted its true meaning. So, again, 
the professional community has created the conditions which are naturally obstructive to a typical person's recovery. And so by necessity, not preference, I now have to add the term authentic when I talk about recovery in order for my listeners to understand the reality of what I'm truly talking about rather than them thinking I'm using the term in the way the professional community deceptively uses it and has twisted that term into something that does not is not what it means. The professional community has been so effective in hijacking the true meaning of the word recovery that do you know what the majority of people in the world think of when they hear that word? They think of recovery as something perpetual. Something that will have to be a perpetual, ongoing part of your life for forever. They think... It means learning coping strategies and applying coping strategies for the rest of their lives while also continuing to live with the underlying causes forever. That's a person who's in recovery if you're going by the professional community's definition of recovery. The true meaning of recovery is returning to the healthy state you enjoyed before you became unhealthy. So, is there such a thing in real life as perpetual recovery? That is, recovery, quote-unquote, that just goes on forever. No, there's no such thing as that. That's just called living unhealthy. Recovery that goes on forever and ever is simply called living unhealthy. Is a person who hasn't had a drip of alcohol for 40 years but still lives with all the unresolved issues that caused him or her to abuse alcohol in the first place, recovered? Has that person recovered? No. They're just not currently abusing alcohol. Can we say that they're recovering? No, we can't say that either. Not drinking, but living with the same unresolved issues that caused you to drink in the first place and doing nothing about those issues is not recovering. It's simply not drinking. Not drinking and recovering are not synonymous. You see, you haven't done anything to address and undo the underlying causes and return to the healthy state you once enjoyed. Therefore, the reality is that the person in this scenario is not recovering. Why is there confusion and lack of clarity about this in the minds of people in general? Well, you take a guess as to who is to thank for this. So, do you see how, when I use terms like authentic recovery, I'm not inventing brand new unnecessary terms. From necessity because of the way the true meaning of these terms have been hijacked and twisted and abused by the professional community, I can't use the term alone by itself anymore because the professional community has seen to it that if I do, my listeners will not understand the true meaning as I intend it, as the word truly means. Now, I've said that recovery is the process of returning back to when you enjoyed health, before you were unhealthy. And you might be saying, well, in the case of many alcoholics, in the case of people with borderline personality disorder, was that ever the case? Yes, it was the case. There was a time when you viewed the world appropriately. You had to learn all the misconceptions and misperceptions that you went on to later adopt. But there was a time you might have been very young when you naturally saw the world the way it is, you had to learn these inappropriate perceptions. So when we talk about recovery, authentic recovery, we're returning, we're adjusting our perspectives back to the way they were when we were born 
and in our very early life the way they would have been if we had had healthy emotional teachers. Same thing with alcoholics. A lot of their problems stem from underlying perspectives that are creating much pain in their lives. There was a time, maybe when they were very young, when they did not live with those perceptions that are creating all that pain. By the way, if you want to hear more about acceptance, we just talked about it. And that was Season 2, Episode 39. So only a couple episodes back, are you able to see how the fact that we even have to debate and wonder what the professional community, what meaning they intend with that, Do you see how that in itself, the fact that we even have to debate that, does nothing to facilitate anybody's ability to understand and implement acceptance into their lives? Does it contribute to people adopting acceptance into their lives? Or does it hinder people's ability to adopt acceptance into their lives? Well, it's clear. It hinders the ability for anybody to do that, because it complicates what's not complicated. You see, the primary issue here is not what the professional community's intended meaning of the term radical is. The primary issue is this. Are they, as a group, insightful enough and interested enough in understanding the effect these unnecessary choices of theirs will have on the very people they are supposed to be helping and educating? And the answer is no. No. As a group, they are not insightful enough to understand these things. No. As a group, they are not interested enough to understand the effect or the way that these things will be received by normal people. When a typical person hears about radical acceptance, what is naturally the first thing that comes to mind? The first thing that naturally comes to the typical person's mind is not inherent. No, the first thing that naturally comes to a typical person's mind is the idea of outrageous or extreme. I'm laughing because we're talking about acceptance, which people already have a problem with. There's already a barrier to acceptance. So you're going to make it more difficult by making them believe that by accepting, by adopting acceptance into their lives, (laughs) that they're doing something outrageous or extreme. (laughs) Do you see how that they're working against the very principle of acceptance? So what matters more, what the professional community's intended meaning is, and that all of them among their colleagues know what they are talking about when they're at their professional conferences milling about and talking? Or does it matter more what the typical people in the community who they're supposed to be helping actually hear and understand And the effect it has on them. See, this comes down to a matter of insight. Of insightfully understanding what effect your choices and approach will have on others. And the professional community as a group is utterly incompetent and negligent in this aspect of helping people. How do I know this? Well, you already know that I personally had extensive interactions with the professional community when I was getting started in my own authentic recovery from borderline personality disorder. Do you think I've forgotten what I naturally thought every time the professional community used these false terms with me? No, I haven't forgotten. I had to work very hard to overcome all of that obstruction to my recovery. The thing that I always highlight is how the professional community has the whole world believing and parroting that everything is a mental health issue. Everywhere you look, I mean literally everywhere you look, people brainlessly 
repeat this term, mental health and mental illness. But in reality, when people refer to mental illness and mental health, what are they actually talking about most of the time? They're talking about emotional health. They're not talking about anything related to mental health, mental illness, or mental functioning at all. A lot of you listening may think I'm splitting hairs, but am I? Am I? Remember, I haven't forgotten the obstruction these false terms created in my own recovery. So do you understand what I'm saying? These terms did not quicken, facilitate, complement my recovery in any way. They didn't educate me correctly in any way. What did they do instead? They delayed and worked against my recovery. They painted false ideas in my head about the very nature of what it was I was dealing with. Do you see how that's a detriment? That's not a compliment. Do you see how that's a barrier? That's an actual barrier to a person making progress to, un- to truly understand what the very nature of what it is they're dealing with and being able to undo the underlying causes of it. So take a walk with me. Imagine I'm a person who, up until age 35, did not have the faintest idea that he was anything but perfectly healthy. Now my life has fallen apart, so at my ex-wife's urging, I go to a therapist. And the therapist tells me what? She tells me that I'm dealing with a mental health issue. Now, every time I do something that my wife is unhappy about, do you know what I do? I throw my hands up and I say, honey, I'm sorry. I'm dealing with a mental health issue. I'm dealing with mental illness. I'm trying. But in the end, what can I do about it? See, it's something my, inside my brain that I have no control over. Was I ever dealing with a mental health issue? No, I wasn't. The professional community improperly educated me. Now, get this, all right? What is the cause of emotional disorder in the first place? Poor emotional education. It's shitty education. So now I want to fix it. I go to the professional community. What do they do? They improperly educate me. They give me my second shitty education. Does that not infuriate you? If it doesn't, it should. So the pro- I go to the professional community, and they improperly educate me about the very nature of of what it is I'm dealing with from the very beginning of my path to recovery. (sighs) I don't understand why the whole world is not just in an uproar about this. Not over my experience. I just don't see what the complication about seeing this, the, the, the outrageous nature of this, the whole thing. So, The professional community improperly educates me about the very nature of what it is I'm dealing with from the very beginning of my path to recovery. And in doing so, they made me subconsciously believe that there was was really nothing I could do, really. That any effort I was willing to put into it had no direction or objective whatsoever. That any effort I put into genuine change were like throwing punches at the wind and bound for failure ultimately, and that any failure of mine to make any long-lasting permanent changes were what? Were excusable. Because why? Because I'm dealing with something that's out of my hands, you see. It's a mental illness. It's a mental health issue. But now consider if I had been told the truth by these dopes instead that mental health had nothing whatsoever to do with what I was dealing with, that my issues were all emotional 
in nature, not mental, that the emotional issues were a result of having been raised with an inappropriate, inaccurate, unhealthy emotional education by my parents. That this unhealthy emotional foundation that had been instilled in, inside of me was causing me to approach life with unhealthy perceptions and ideas. That the disorder and unhappiness in my life were a natural, direct result of the subtle perceptions that I had been taught and had always lived with. That perceptions can be straightened out and corrected, and that once they are, a person doesn't have to try to think, feel, and behave and behave healthfully. That thinking, feeling, and behaving healthfully is a natural result and product of simply living with healthily adjusted perspectives. Oh boy, that would have made all the difference. Yes, of course. It would have saved me years. I would have been, in that scenario, working on an accurate premise from the very beginning. How many years of my recovery would that have shaved off? You know, I tell you, it took me seven years. It would have at least shaved off two years. Two years. I might have even saved my marriage. I might have saved my marriage. I might still have all my friends. I might still have my same job. Who knows? Who knows? When nobody will ever know because of these dopes incompetence to understand the terminology that they use matters. When it's completely wrong, that matters. It has a tremendous negative effect, creates a tremendous barrier to a person understanding the nature of what it is they're dealing with in the first place. Do you understand that if you... If you don't understand the nature, the the very nature of what it is you're dealing with and what it is you're trying to do, you're, you're banging your head off the wall. That's what you're doing. You're walking into a wall. Or you're just being directed out into a cornfield, out into the middle of nowhere, da ba da ba da just wandering around out there, no direction, because you don't even know what you're doing what the nature of the thing is that you're you're trying to fix <laughs> you're just wandering around is the professional community's choice and support of terminology irrelevant it absolutely is not irrelevant is your choice of terminology irrelevant no it's not irrelevant Not only are you personally obstructing your own recovery every time you parrot and continue to use these false terms that are endorsed by the professional community, but worse, you're supporting the professional community in their worldwide obstruction to every single person on this planet's opportunity to escape emotional unhealth and experience genuine inner peace and contentment and emotional health to authentically rid themselves of these issues permanently once and for all. You're contributing to that. And when you use those terms, you parrot those terms, you think it doesn't matter. Everybody else is using them, right? Everybody else is using them. What does it matter if we hone in on what these terms actually mean and imply? Well, you're supporting the professional community's negligence and moral crimes when you parrot these terms. It's not a small thing. Will you and I see great comprehensive reform in the professional community as a group in our lifetimes? No, that's not the point of this. There's still no excuse to continue supporting any aspect of their deception or incompetence as a group, if you have any choice in the matter. They can't spread a term that everybody refuses to use. Now, I can't cause any real reform alone, but those of you who hear what I'm saying and understand from firsthand experience, insightfully, what I'm talking about, 
and that these things that I highlight are so much more subtly destructive than most average people in the world appreciate, there are several things you can do to help. Number one, you can work to insightfully understand which terms work against people's recovery. And if you think that I'm using terminology that works against somebody's recovery, I hope you'll let me know. And I'll think hard and deep on it. If I think that the cost outweighs the benefits, believe me, I'll change. I'll find a different term to use. But, you know, a lot of these things are from my firsthand experience, my very firsthand experience. I remember the misinformation that it naturally communicated to me. And, you know, these therapists, when they use a term, one of these special terms of theirs, they don't go on to explain in depth what it means. They just throw it out there, right? And then you just start parroting it, don't you? Blah, 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 blah. Just start parroting it. I mean, I'm, I'm not making fun of anybody. I did the same thing until I realized this can't be right. <laughs> All of this is contradictory. This can, none of this stuff can be right. Number two. You can choose to not use those terms incorrectly yourself. And number three, you can kindly, gingerly help other people think for themselves. Now, I want to emphasize kindly and gingerly. You don't want to make somebody feel like you're trying to start an argument or attacking them. But you can take a moment to explain why those terms are inaccurate and why those people are perpetuating barriers to other people's recovery, to their authentic recovery. I can tell you right now how they're going to reply. They're going to say, well, that's the official term that the professional community uses, as if this settles the matter and they don't have to think for themselves honestly about it. You see, what does it mean that the professional community chooses that word? It means nothing. Still stop and take a thought for yourself about what you're actually saying when you use those terms. Think about what they imply. Think about the message that it gives to a typical listener hearing those terms. And do you know how uh, you will respond to people who say, well, that's the official term that the professionals use? You're going to respond this way. I know that many of them do. They're wrong. That's how you respond to that. I know that they do. They're wrong. Then be persuasive. Like I said, don't attack them, but be persuasive. Help them see why it doesn't matter if the professional community uses those terms or not. The term is still wrong. Much like I've done with you today, with just a couple of terms, you know, the list is never ending, so I only chose a couple today. What makes a term right or wrong? How about who come up with it? Is that what matters? What makes them right or wrong is whether or not they accurately educate and whether they facilitate people's recovery. That's really all that matters. Do you know what the uh, alternative is? That the terms are inaccurate. They unnecessarily create confusion and obstruct people's recovery. And this brings me back to a question I asked uh, toward the beginning of this discussion. Why do you think the professional community as a group is compelled to come up with unnecessary terms that only work to obstruct people's recovery in the first place. As just one example, now remember I said that the list is never ending, but as one example, there's a movement within the professional community to call borderline personality disorder something entirely else, something entirely different. Why? Ask yourself what the motivations for this are. Is there really some benefit to your recovery from the professional community choosing to change the name of borderline personality disorder to 
emotional unstable personality disorder, for example, as I understand that they're trying to do. There's no benefit to your recovery at all. In fact, this new name, emotionally unstable personality disorder, tells you a lie. (laughs) Get this. The very name itself is an outright lie about the true nature of the disorder it's supposed to identify. It communicates the notion that your emotions behave differently than normal people's emotions. And the reality is that your emotions have never behaved in any way other than normal. That's right. You heard me correctly. You do not experience emotions any differently than anybody else on this earth. So once again, the professional community and their incompetence just doesn't fail to disappoint, does it? Just does not fail to... They have to one-up themselves. Every time they do something totally incompetent and stupid, you, you you can rest assured that the next thing they do will be a one-up. They're going to try to one-up their stupidity and incompetence from the last time. You remember what I said was at the root of the things you feel and the way in which you feel them? It's your thoughts or perceptions. You know, perceptions just are thoughts. So it's your perceptions that are the problem, not your feelings. Listen to this very closely. Anybody, literally anybody, who would be walking around with the same perceptions you live with would interpret experiences and therefore feel the, re- the naturally resulting emotions in the same intensities and manner as you do. So your emotions are not the problem. Your emotions are not any less stable than anybody else's emotions. Do you understand that? And do you understand that if anybody perceived an experience through the same understanding and filter that you do, which causes you to fly off the handle or get extremely sad or experience extreme jealousy, that anybody, anybody else viewing the same experience with the same underlying perceptions that you live with would also fly off the handle or get extremely sad or experience extreme jealousy, and it would seem just as sudden and unusual to those around him or her. It's your perceptions. Your perceptions are incorrect in many cases and need to be corrected. Once they're corrected, the filter you use to interpret experiences and see the world will, as a naturally occurring product, do you understand that? As a naturally occurring product of viewing the thing differently, you'll have a complete change in the feelings you feel as well and and the intensities in which you feel them. So if the professional community does these things and chooses these terms and makes the decisions they make, but it has no positive, constructive, facilitating effect on anybody's authentic recovery, you've got to ask yourself, Why do they do it at all? Well, they do it for themselves and for appearances. It's a stroking of intellect. For whose benefit? Yours? No, it's for their benefit. It makes me sick. In your recovery, I'd like you to remember this gold nugget of advice. Hold on to it tight and come back and admire it often. Are you ready? Are you taking notes? I'm not kidding. This advice that I'm about to give you ranks right up there with feelings are never right or wrong, good or bad, the difference between guilt and shame, and everybody else is the weather. You have no control over what it'll do. It's in the top five list, the top five last symptom list of most important advice you will hear from me. Here it is. Whenever you have a chance, 
simplify, simplify, simplify. At all cost, resist the urge to complicate what does not have to be complicated. At all cost, resist the urge to get distracted by anything that is not relevant and to only stay focused on what is relevant. If you're going along and you realize your time and attention is being misdirected or wasted in a direction or on a thing that is not relevant, dump it immediately. Regain focus on only what is relevant. What is relevant? I'll tell you. Anything that facilitates and works in harmony with your recovery. So what is not relevant? What is not relevant is anything that obstructs or works against your recovery in any way. Overcomplicating things, making them complex, may make a person feel like they're doing something. But it's literally doing lots of stuff while accomplishing nothing. Did you catch that? Overcomplicating things makes a person feel like they're doing something. They're doing lots of stuff while accomplishing nothing. It's a time and energy waster. And one of its purposes, just one of its purposes, is to forever put off ever having to do anything that matters. Simplify. Simplifying things is constructive. It works hand in hand with true understanding and progress. If you can explain what is often a complex thing to others simply, it often means you understand that thing profoundly. People who are in the habit of trying to simplify things are those who are genuinely interested in understanding and not dragging their feet and wasting time and being misdirected and distracted. They're not interested in that. Those who simplify things are interested in understanding. Why? So they can understand what to do. Why? So they can then do it. But what about the people who are in the habit of complicating things? of making things complex and putting significance where there is none. Well, they may have lots of reasons motivating them to do this. But one of these reasons is that they either consciously or subconsciously or unconsciously simply enjoy the debate. Or they like stroking their own sense of intellect. Or they enjoy the appearances. But also... As long as they feel like they are so busy and active doing all this pointless stuff, you know, it's ultimately, it's pointless. It doesn't contribute in any way to any actual achievement or progress or greater goal. But because they're doing lots of stuff, they actually feel like they're doing something, you see, but it doesn't require them to do what is necessary. They're only wasting time and avoiding doing anything that matters. Surely you've seen people who use the most eloquent words and they talk for hours and they make comparisons to all sorts of things and they make tons of speculations that don't seem in any way related and and nothing. And that's it. (laughs) All of that that I just described was the whole purpose for all of it. Do you see what I'm saying? The whole purpose was just the talking and speculating. That was the purpose. That was the whole objective, just to talk and speculate. Don't get caught up in that. It moves you forward, not at all. That reminds me, I I just saw this movie 1917 over the weekend, which was just amazing. that, That was the best movie I've seen in a long time. And there's a part where the main character, a soldier, is parting ways with a Captain Smith. This Captain Smith has given this guy a ride in his uh, 
you know, wagon train of, of trucks to kind of speed this guy's journey along. And the main character is racing against time to deliver a message to the front lines that will save thousands of soldiers' lives. So as the main character is parting company from Captain Smith, Smith turns back to him as he's walking away, and he says, If you do manage to get to Colonel McKenzie, make sure there's witnesses. And the main character replies, These are direct orders. And Captain Smith says, I know, but some men just want the fight. I could not help but compare that dialogue from the movie to my own experience in my own authentic recovery and now in my current experiences of trying to help others. Do, do you see, some people just want the debate. That is the end goal. Some people just want to create the illusion of doing something while doing nothing. Some people just want the illusion of insight, the illusion of understanding. These things are literally more important to some people than actual understanding, than actual insight, than actual effort, than actual progress. You know, it's one of the reasons why as soon as I detect that a person is disingenuous for asking me a question, I end the conversation because I don't have to waste my time with people who just want the debate. The only reason I'd ever allow myself to get pulled into such a discussion willingly would be if I just don't recognize or understand how cost-benefit works. But fortunately for me, I do understand how cost-benefit works. And fortunately, I started implementing this into my approach to things a long time ago during my own recovery. This is uh, something we're probably going to have to talk about in the future. What is the cost? We talk about cost-benefit. So let's say I, I got this conversation. Somebody who's disingenuous wants to get a conversation started with me. What's the cost? Well, the cost is my time. It's my energy. It's the time and energy I could be spending on myself or on others who are receptive. So then what's the benefit? The benefit is literally nothing. Do, do you see how if I allow myself to get engaged in that way, I'm literally losing everything and gaining nothing. What is the cost benefit for you getting misdirected on irrelevant matters in your recovery? Well, the cost is your time, your attention, your energy, your overall comprehension, your focus. What's the benefit? Absolutely nothing. So, like I say, there's a discussion we'll probably be having in the future that will probably ride along pretty similarly to the discussion we've had today. Understanding cost-benefit analysis. Not wasting your time ever on anything that is not going to harmonize or complement your recovery effort. Being smart enough, insightful enough to be making that evaluation always and being willing to dump or drop whatever your attention has gotten sucked into that is not going to result in any benefit. That's called cost-benefit analysis. We'll talk about that at a future date in great detail. Well, my friends, we've reached the end. Let me remind you about thelastsymptom.com. Holy mackerel, you see how I slipped that in there? What was that, six times? Six times I slipped in thelastsymptom.com. Oh, well, that's seven. If you're willing and able, support my efforts with a donation while you're there. What are some other ways you can support my work? Leave this show a positive review on iTunes or on whatever platform you personally prefer to listen to it. 
subscribe to the official YouTube channel. Speaking of YouTube, I promised we would talk a little bit more about it. As my followers there on YouTube should know by now, YouTube locked down my channel for over a week with absolutely no explanation. I think it was two weeks, maybe over two weeks, and no explanation. And I did a show about a couple of episodes back about that, and uh, now the channel is open back up for now. So I'm moving forward cautiously. I'll be honest with you, I don't like the people running YouTube. I don't trust them. I don't trust their intelligence. I don't trust their ethics. I don't trust their consistency in their approach to anything. Last of all, I don't trust their value for the fundamental principles that make their company possible in the first place. So I'm moving forward with them cautiously. As in, I'm trying to put into place alternatives to their service just in case they ever decide to utterly take control of the topic of information that my work revolves around. You know, they're already doing it, deciding who people can listen to and who they can't listen to based on who they deem as legitimate sources of information or not. It's an absolute affront to the very fundamental principles of free society. All they would have to do is say, well, this last symptom guy says things that contradict the professional community. We're going to silence him on our platform. Ironic, isn't it? The same professional community that's preventing people from authentically recovering from things like emotional disorder, not even educating them about what the true nature of these emotional disorders are. But YouTube could say, well, so let's just silence him and get him out of here so that people only have access to the information that we claim is accurate. For this reason, it would probably be a good idea for everybody who wants me to be able to communicate with him in the future, despite whatever fascist policies these tech companies enact, to create a profile for yourself over at thelastsymptom.com. Yes, I know. I, I slipped it in there again. My official website so that I can at least, at least, send out notices to people to keep them in the loop and let everybody know when these tech companies do things like this in the future like they did here recently to me. You know, uh, the, the, the most painful part of the YouTube experience was that I couldn't even make a video to let people on YouTube know that I was having trouble informing them about what was going on. Folks, have a wonderful week. This is Brian Barnett. My voice is giving out. Signing off. Mm-hmm.